Welcome to Catalyst Church Online Campus. If you're joining us for the very first time today, I'd like to welcome you to our study. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We have a connection team here at Catalyst Church, and they would love to help you connect with our community. Take a moment, if you would, let us know you're here today. You should see some instructions on your screen there for you to let us know that you've joined us. And if you're joining us on YouTube, take a moment and click the subscribe button. That way you can join us each week as we upload new studies here on the Catalyst Church Online Campus. I also want to thank you for your continued, generous, and faithful giving to the ministries of Catalyst Church. You can give securely using our online giving platform. Let's take a moment right now and ask the Lord's blessing over the tithes and offerings this week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your love and mercy. Lord, as you give to us and provide in us and in our lives everything we need, asking only that we return to you of our material possessions, Lord, of that first tenth, the called the tithe. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to learn your stewardship principles as we do so. Thank you for the tithes and offerings, Lord, as your people give today. I ask for your hand of blessing to be upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I read an online news article the other day about the city of Coronado, California, defying both uh, the trends and some of the policies of the state of California in regards to homelessness. First, they defy the trend in California homelessness by having none of it. And second, they defy state policies by tolerating none of it. I don't know, maybe we can actually reverse those two facts. Maybe it's because they don't tolerate it, they, they don't have any. Anyone in, in Coronado found living in a tent or encampment apparently is immediately given two options. One, engage immediately in real treatment and help, or two, be escorted out of their town immediately. The mayor of Coronado, California, uh, named Richard Bailey, said this, the fact of the matter is although there are a myriad of reasons that people end up homeless, they eventually only fall into two camps, those that want help and those that do not want help. And those that are refusing to get help should not be granted the additional ability to break laws, such as tent encampments or the sidewalk or urinating or defecating in public. I mean, really, what horrible people, huh? The audacity of treating homeless people with actual dignity and respect, offering actual help to change their situation. Who do they think they are? I mean, obviously I'm being sarcastic. I mean, really, to treat their own taxpayers and business owners as if they had a right to the safety and quality of life of the town. It's scandalous, isn't it? Well, I share this story because it perfectly sets up our discussion of the third foundational principle of building our rhythm that of our temple. We're in this series called Building Our Rhythm, and we're looking at those pieces of our faith practice that could we construct our rule of life. And before we go any further, our temple incorporates more than our physical bodies. It is our physical, emotional, and mental selves combined. And that is a crucial understanding that we in the Western world often mistake. Separating out and isolating our physical selves from our mental selves and from our emotional selves, that is a purely academic exercise. It has no basis in reality. Our temple is a compound of our body, mind, and soul. And we are just as unique in these as we are in every other facet of our lives. We each have different stories, different inputs that have resulted in who we are. We have complex dynamic inputs, family, genetics, culture, occurrences, experiences, education, traumas, triumphs. Not a single human being ever has or ever will have the exact same combination of these various factors as we. Truthfully, our lives are really just a long-term exploration of these factors. And the person who wants to live fully the dream God has for them needs to take serious the task of unpacking all that went into and all that goes into making them. Let's start with Psalm 139. Psalm 139, if you want to join me there, verse 13. For it was you, God, you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. 
I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. You know, at some point, all of our complex dynamic inputs come down to a similarly stark either or question as that mayor of coronado california declared we each choose to recognize these complex dynamic legitimate inputs good or bad negative or positive nurturing or traumatic and then we each decide whether they are building blocks for our life or stumbling blocks in our life let me say that again. We each decide whether all of these complex inputs are building blocks for our life or stumbling blocks in our life. Listen, victimization is entirely legitimate. Victimhood is entirely chosen. You and I, we can be legitimately victimized by others or by genetic lottery through no choice of our own but victimhood is always chosen by the person who decides to define themselves by the label of whatever it is that happened the, the cultural statement it is what it is that's real but we don't often stop there we don't often use it just to say it is what it is whatever we're talking about we usually actually mean it will be what it is. And that is a lie of Satan that far too many accept unthinkingly. And often it's because they have not built a rhythm in their temple. In a few minutes, we're going to look at four practices for building a rhythm in our temple. But first, let's peel back the layers and talk about the secret sauce. The secret sauce for building a rhythm in our temple, our body, mind, and soul, is contentedness contentedness turn with me if you would to philippians chapter 4 philippians chapter 4 beginning at verse 11 paul writes this i don't say this out of need for i have learned to be content in whatever circumstances i find myself i know how to i know both how to make do with little and i know how to make do with a lot in any and all circumstances i have learned the secret of being content whether well fed or hungry whether in abundance or in need i am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, it's contentedness, not contentment. Contentment is a destination. In fact, it's a destination that if we really think about it, our fallen sin nature will never allow us to arrive at this side of eternity. We're never actually content. There's always more than our sin nature desires. Contentedness is a value that we live by and we choose in any moment that we desire to. Contentedness allows us to overcome the pressure to make our physical self, our physical reality more important than God intends it to be. This goes beyond turning physical wellness into an idolatry that many people do. It means not allowing our physical realities to prevent us from pursuing God's dream. Contentedness is not resigned despair. It is choosing the reasonable, balanced perspective. See, resigned despair is when we inflate it is what it is into it will be what it is. Contentedness requires we wrestle between acquiescing and accommodating and ignoring our abilities or afflictions. I've shared before one of the things I lost the genetic lottery when it comes to the ability to tan. Whenever the sun comes out, I have to go in. I have, I'm actually a ginger, and so I have the most pale skin. And the moment the sun starts shining, I start burning. Now, I could just simply, in a you know, resigned despair, say, well, that's it. I'll see you, you know, next fall and hang out in my basement. That's not accommodating, that's despairing. There's nothing I can do to change my genetic makeup when it comes to my ability to burn. 
So I accommodated. I just put on a hat. And, you know, I don't go shirtless in the summertime. And I slather up with SPF 472 whenever the sun comes out. That's accommodating my reality. I'm acquiescing to it. I'm giving in to the reality that is a truth. I do not and will not tan. I will always burn. But I have to go on with life. So contentedness means I accommodate the reality. I, I give in to it. And in a sense, I ignore it. And do what I can do. Again, cover up, slather up. But I continue to do what I need to do. You know, nowhere in the pursuit of God's dream is the promise that it will be easy or without obstacle. Somewhere along the line, we pick up the mistaken belief that if God is in something, it will be easy and inevitable. Seriously, show me one person in Scripture whom God directed and moved in their life, and their story appears easy. I mean, Jesus told his disciples to cross the Sea of Galilee to the other side. He never said, stay dry. Contentedness is about living our fullest life in the midst of our reality, not in a fantasy. Contentedness is Ludwig von Beethoven composing the majority of his oeuvre after he went deaf. You want exercise in challenging your assumptions about humanity's capacity, do this. Find the best headphones or the best speakers you can. Trust me. And lay down on the floor in a dark room and listen to the entirety of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. That'll be the best hour and six minutes that you'll invest in yourself in a long time. And while listening, remind yourself that he never heard it. Not while composing it and not while it was performed. He never heard his own final masterpiece. Beethoven acquiesced to the reality of his deafness. And he continued to compose anyways, relying upon his you know, years of experience and internalizing of the music. He heard it inside. But he never actually heard many of his most powerful works. That is astounding. The contentedness is the secret sauce for a life lived to the fullest of God's dream in the midst of the myriad factors and challenges confronting us. Okay, now let's get to the four rhythms of clearing the temple. The first is a rhythm of rest. So we're talking about building a rhythm in our life. Those things that we do that create a structure that our faith grows upon. And today, as we talk about clearing the temple, the first is a rhythm of rest. We were created with rest as a critical component, not as an optional luxury. Come on, sleep is not for the weak, and exhaustion is not a signal of importance. Rest is about recovery and recharge. It's a backward and forward focus. And that includes a purposeful Sabbath practice, not a Sabbath fantasy, but a purposeful Sabbath practice. God's desire for our rest is built into our design, and life goes so much better when we do not go against his design for our life. Try reducing stress. I mean, you can plan more intentionally and regularly, you know, calendar crunching and such. In fact, I would say it is a moment of spiritual maturity when we realize that we are the agents of the majority of our own stress. We can simplify our lifestyle demands. It's okay to simply say, sorry, I'm unavailable, or simply, no. We build rest into our schedule, daily, weekly, monthly, seasonally, annually, a rhythm of rest. Second is a rhythm of replenishment. It starts with, honestly, eat real food. Supplement depleted nutrients. Is this nutritional advice? Absolutely. Is it limited to food? Absolutely not. We replenish, we stimulate mentally with life-giving material. Philippians chapter 4, while we're there in Philippians, go to, was verse 8. 
Paul writes, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. And the word he uses there for dwell is great. It's the word for tabernacle, meaning pitch your tent, live in these things, replenish with these things, stock the shelves of your soul. I was in a uh, a Zoom meeting during the pandemic, sitting in my home study, and my home study is crammed with books. I've shared before. I collect books, and I'm in control. I can quit anytime. But one of the participants on the the Zoom meeting, you know, could see through my camera and such that I was surrounded by books. And they asked which of my books were most valuable. Well, immediately I just turned it to a pointed to a stack of books on a table just inside the door by far my most important and most valuable books right there next to the door. And I said, that's my read next stack. I always have a stack that is to be read next. Constantly rotating through it as I grab one off the top, I put one on the bottom. When that stack is completed, I'll die. I'm constantly replenishing my soul. And that's my point. Don't treat soul replenishment as an accidental afterthought. Prioritize it into your rhythm. Watch what happens over time in your life. That leads us to a, a rhythm of renewal. Take all of your vacation time and use it for actual vacation. Get involved in some ex exercise or activity. Blow out the cobwebs every once in a while. Invest time and effort into restorative hobbies and recreation. I bet you've experienced this. Have you ever dedicated hours and hours to an activity, you know, looking up only to realize you spent the entire day at it and you never realized it? Or you maybe you collapse into bed in utter delighted exhaustion and you can't wait to do it again. Why does this happen? Renewal. Bobby and I use the term life-giving all the time, but we use it more as a filter. We ask ourselves, is this activity life-giving? Are we doing anything life-giving this week or this weekend? Make sure that your life incorporates also some form of creative outlet, something that you create as an expression of yourself. Do not underestimate this. I mean, the Dead Sea in Israel is dead because it has no outlet. And you and I, we are much the same. Okay, so we've, we've briefly looked at building rhythms of rest, replenishment, and renewal. So now lastly, a rhythm of release. Care for your body without making an idol of it. Tend to your needs without becoming enslaved to them. Release yourself from the bondage. Boy, release yourself from the bondage to how you feel. Just because you do or do not feel like doing something may not be the best filter. In fact, that's often an enslavement in our lives. And for the love of all that is holy, Stop treating doctors as if they were the oracle at Delphi pronouncing the definition of your life. Probably a little bit of a soapbox, I'm sure. Doctors can diagnose physical symptoms. Come on. But doctors cannot tell you who you are. And they cannot foretell your future. Okay, this is definitely a soapbox. Become aware of the, this nuance that naming diseases and conditions is just marketing by the medical industry to keep us addicted to their notions and potions. I'm not anti-doctor at all. This is, are there medications that will fight inflammation and infection in our bodies? Absolutely. Are there chemical compounds and treatments that will help with chemical imbalance in our bodies? Absolutely. I'm not for a second advocating shunning medical intervention. What I am suggesting is stop letting the so-called conditions define who you are. You do not have anti-diasplastic rheumatoidal biomyalgic duptitis, whatever that, you know what that means. What you may currently have are some range or selection of physical symptoms that may or may not respond to medication or treatment, but likely will respond to changes in rhythms of nutrition, exercise, rest, and creative outlet. No, I am not saying all you need is wheatgrass juice, some colored pencils, and a nap, and you'll be fine. But far too many of us have become convinced to elevate doctors to practically joining the Godhead in defining who we are and what we can or cannot do 
in life. What I am saying is that we need a rhythm of releasing ourselves from the definitions and enslavements of a sin-sick fallen world. A sin-sick fallen society and a, a victimhood culture that creates ever more creative and legitimate sounding excuses. Please excuse Bill from life. He has an incurable disease called life isn't as easy as he was promised. Dr. Fauci told him so. Building that rhythm of release is about reminding ourselves to whom we belong, to whom our temple belongs, our body, mind, and soul temple. Let's look one last verse here today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul writes to the Corinthians, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Glorify God with your body. You know the cliche, use it or lose it. That's not a scriptural statement per se, but it is absolutely a biblical concept when it comes to stewarding the resource of our temple. I had a phone conversation actually just this past week with a friend of mine, and he has breakfast every week with a multi-billionaire in the Seattle area. Well, at a recent breakfast, they were talking about retirement, slowing down, because this man happens to be 81 years old. And he said something, this multi-billionaire octogenarian said something to my friend. I will never stop doing what I do. I will never retire. What would I do with myself? So here's a question. Does anything obligate God to continue investing in our lives? Continue pouring life into us? Is he obligated to do so? If we believe that he is the author and sustainer of our lives, is there a moral imperative for him to continue doing so? Or an intrinsic reason he should continue to pour his energy and resources into our lives? I guess the real question that I'm asking, similar to the Paul's statement, so glorify God with your body. Is our temple utilized such that it motivates God to continue investing? Why would he give us health and vitality? Why should he give us health and vitality? Is it in his best interest to do so? Have we proven by how we use our temple. Is our temple utilized such that it motivates him to continue? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you've created us purposefully and intentionally. You've also created us, Lord, with resiliency to endure the things that we perhaps would never have chosen for ourselves. And you've created us with the capacity for building rhythm of rest, of renewal, of replenishment. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. I pray that as each of us continues to build a rhythm in our lives, and as we look this week specifically at the rhythm of our temple, our body, mind, and soul, Holy Spirit, would you lead us with an accuracy and an insight. Grant us a wisdom and a discerning mind to see where it is that the rhythm can better reflect all that you have dreamed for us. And Jesus, would you be glorified as we do so. In your name, amen. Amen. Oh, hey, on behalf of our entire Catalyst Church family, thank you for taking time to engage with God's word today. I sincerely hope you're blessed. By these times, I pray that this week you would grow further into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. May the Lord richly bless your week ahead as you follow and trust him. God bless you.